Morning. I have a couple of folks on here, but we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe some others will join. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is go over some cases that I've submitted online. And uh, the idea here is basically just to kind of walk through how we diagnose things histologically. We've got about you know, 14, 15 cases. We may get through these. We may not get through all of them. Um, so again, I think this is just an approach that I used on a daily basis many times and uh, something that you can use if you use this and you practice this, what, what we're sort of talking about here and learn some of the date details, uh, you will definitely pass your boards. So here we've got a punch biopsy, nice punch biopsy, probably taken from somewhere like trunk or proximal extremity. And you can see low power, there's this infiltrate of these cells up here. And they don't look jet black like we would see with lymphocytes. They look sort of, to me, kind of a little bit purple. They don't really look dark black. You see a lymphocyte at low magnification, magnification, it really looks black, even though if you get to higher magnification, it's really dark purple. And um, so we're not sure, is it inflammatory or neoplastic? I mean, they certainly don't look like just typical classic inflammatory cells. As you go to higher magnification, you can see that these cells are really very monomorphous. One looks pretty much just like another. And that's a nice clue to the diagnosis of uh, a form of mast cell disease, mastocytosis, uh, mastocytoma, urticaria pigmentosa, all those diseases are kind of lumped together. They're all part of the same general process. This has got so many cells that we would call this a mastocytoma. Um, and these are the kind of lesions that are often seen in, in babies, infants. Um, if you ever encounter one of these clinically, um, you don't want to go in and say, can we elicit a derriere sign on this? Uh, you certainly can elicit a derriere sign, but they often will degranulate so many mast cells that they can actually get um, systemic symptoms and, and shock. So I've, I've seen patients that uh, actually have died because people have gone in and and rub really hard on a, on a mastocytoma. If you look at the individual cells, the really beautiful examples of mast cells, and this is as high as we can go on the digital image, but the cells have a, a granular cytoplasm. It's kind of, is kind of slightly purplish, if you will. And if you look at the uh, cells, if you look at them in cross-section, they look like fried eggs. They, they're round central nuclei with the cytoplasm surrounding them. And then if you look at them in a uh, longitudinal section, they kind of look a little bit like hot dogs. They're very elongated. Um, so I can find one that's cut a little bit more longitudinal for you here. Uh, but anyway, these are, are, there's one right there. So every single cell here is a mast cell. And, you know, they probably, it looks like they did an excision of this. Um, so chances are they injected the lidocaine at the periphery of the lesion, because if you inject the lidocaine into the lesion, it degranulates the mast cells also. And so uh, a lot of the allergists and people that deal with potential mastocytosis, they will actually inject kind of in a ring fashion around the lesion. They won't actually inject the lesion itself, and then they'll take the biopsy of the lesion. Um, you can stain these if you need to. If you just look at something like this, you really don't need a stain. Uh, some of the stains that we use for mast cells are tryptase, immunoperoxidase stain, which is positive, CV117 will stain these. Um, and then you can use the uh, stains like Gimsa and Wright stain. Uh, those are positive as well. Those are called metachromatic stains. They'll take the cells uh, and they, they it's, they're not actually really staining. They're, it's almost kind of a biochemical reaction. And the uh, Wright stain kind of turns a, a beautiful purple when you look at it under the microscope. So that's a nice example of a masto cytoma. Okay, this next one is another one that's a, a nice uh, example of this, and it's another punch biopsy, and at low magnification, you see how totally different this looks than the last one. Um, you can see that it's, there's, once again, the process is confined mostly to the dermis. Uh, these cells at low power look really pale, and so when you see something that looks pale at low magnification, it looks like an inflammatory process, you should think that they may very likely going to be histiocytes. Um, and so it, it, if I saw this at low magnification, I'd probably say, well, you know, no epidermal involvement. Cells are kind of look like they're between and among collagen bundles and they're pale. I would probably think of granulomanulari as a first uh, diagnosis. Um, 
just looking at it at low magnification. But as you go to higher magnification, it's got some other features that uh, show that it really is not granulary. Uh, it's got the this material here, which is uh, bluish gray, and it looks a lot like mucin. But if you look at the individual cells themselves, they're actually filled with this same bluish gray material. And these are not uh, the histiocytes that you see in, in GA, which do not have anything in their cytoplasm. The mucin in GA is present between the cells. It's in the dermis. And here you've got the, the cells that contain this material. And this is lipid. And uh, basically what we have here is uh, an eruptive xanthoma. And eruptive xanthomas histologically can look a lot like granulomanulary. And that's because the lipid, which is uh, this clear material over here, when it gets outside the cells, takes on this kind of bluish gray color that kind of looks like mucin. But you can uh, exclude the diagnosis of GA where you can identify these foam cells in here. Uh, so this is a nice example of an eruptive xanthoma, and it does, I've seen the diagnosis missed as granulomanulary a number of times over the years. Uh, another entity that can sometimes look a little bit like this um, is sclerodema, like a myxidematosis. That also can give you histiocytes scattered between them on college bundles. Um, they don't get foamy histiocytes, but you get histiocytes and fibroblasts arranged sort of in a north, south, east, west, sort of distribution, the so-called busy dermis type of uh, differential diagnosis. And there you also get mucin between the individual uh, collagen bumps, but you do not get mucin inside the cells uh, in that entity. So nice example. And this is primarily triglyceride here. Uh, if they were to show you something like this on the board examination and ask some questions about it, um, you'd need to know that the main lipid in an eruptive xanthoma is triglyceride. A lot of these patients will have uh, triglyceride levels of, you know, 5,000, you know, something like that, really high triglyceride levels. And they, they're they called eruptive xanthomas because they do occur eruptively and often seen in patients that have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. Um, and these things literally, literally will develop in a matter of, of minutes. They can come up very quickly. And when you uh, reverse the abnormal lipid levels, they actually can go away pretty quickly. So if you've ever seen that, it's, it's highly impressive. You, you sort of don't think that uh, these foam cells like this would kind of be able to be reabsorbed as quickly as they can, but they, they really can. It's, it's very impressive. So that's an eruptive xanthoma. Um, I don't, they, I doubt that they would ask you on an examination to distinguish among the various types of xanthomas histologically, uh, but this pattern looks completely different than say like a tuberous xanthoma, uh, a planar xanthoma, those kind of uh, xanthomas, they, they don't really have as much triglyceride in them, and they usually do not have any extracellular lipid. And they're usually more nodular lesions, especially a, a tuberous or tendinous xanthoma. Those are large nodular aggregations, pretty much just containing these cells uh, without the extracellular lipids. And those lesions don't come up quickly. They take years to develop and um, to get their lipids controlled. They don't go away very quickly either. So those are more longstanding kinds of xanthomas as opposed to these. Okay, here we've got a, uh, probably an excisional biopsy. It's a pretty large biopsy specimen, and we've got something going on in the, in the dermis here. So an initial thought would be that it's probably a neoplastic condition, and uh, it's pale cells again. There's some that are a little bit darker, but mostly they look a little bit pale. So you know, if it's if it's if it's epithelial, we might think something maybe more like an adnexal tumor or something like that. It doesn't really look like a typical basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, something like that at low magnification. Is it benign or malignant? It's the other thing we're going to ask ourselves. Um, it's in the deep dermis here, and if you just look at the lesion itself, it looks relatively symmetrical. But there's one pitfall in using architectural criteria for defining benign versus malignant when you're dealing with a lesion that's kind of like this in the, in the mid-reticular dermis. Metastatic lesions um, can look pseudo-benign because they're like often cannonball metastases, and so they're round, and one side can look alike, very much like the other side. So at low magnification and the metastasis, you might say, well, it looks benign, and then you have to use other features when you go to higher magnification, looking for things like necrosis or multibiotic figures that are very atypical, you know, things of that nature. So anyway, that's kind of what we do at low magnification here. 
and we go to higher magnification, and you can see it's got these multiple aggregations of these cells. Um, it's you know seemingly relatively well contained, so it's not diffuse, and we can kind of draw uh, a line around the whole thing. There's there's like one aggregation here, another aggregation here, and then this kind of large aggregation here. I can't really tell for sure what kinds of cells they are yet. I mean, it could be nebo melanocytic, uh, it could be maybe an adnexal neoplasm. And so as we get to the highest magnification, now we can actually begin to see some characteristic features. And the individual cells have these very small, uh, somewhat crenated nuclei. Uh, the cytoplasm has got these fine granules within them. Uh, and they, they're kind of on these pink, purplish color to the granules. Cells are small. They're typical. They're no mitotic figures. There's no bizarre anaplasia, anything like that. And so this is a nice example of a granular cell tumor. And it's a little interesting because um, it's so deep in the dermis. Often granular cell tumors occur up in this area, and they're often associated with overlying epidermal hyperplasia. In fact, they can give pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia. And sometimes, in fact, I've seen the diagnosis missed. I've even done it myself <laughs> over the years, believe it or not where there's been a shaved biopsy of a granular cell tumor that just hits only the epidermal changes and maybe just get a few granular cells that really aren't obvious because the biopsy is not adequate and uh, can be called a squamous cell carcinoma. So that's that's kind of a pitfall. Uh, a granular cell tumor is a neural neoplasm. It's a uh, called a neurochristopathy is another name for a general family of, of these lesions that have neural and nevomelanocytic differentiation, including things like Merkel cell carcinoma and uh, small cell carcinoma of the APID system. Um, so it's in that same family. Uh, this, the granules themselves are comprised of uh, breakdown products of uh, improperly formed myelin. So they're in the Schwannian category, and therefore you can stain these with S100 protein, and they're strongly positive. Um, also stained with PAS, which highlights the granules very nicely as well. Um, they're often seen on the tongue, and they're often seen in dark-skinned individuals. So uh, it's a very fairly uh, common lesion. If you see like a, a nodule lesion in the tongue, especially in an African-American patient or something like that, it really should come up fairly high in the differential diagnosis. And because they occurred in an area like the tongue where there were a lot of muscle uh, cells in there years ago, before we really knew what the differentiation of this was, this was actually thought to be a lesion with muscle differentiation. In fact, it used to be called granular cell myoblastoma, uh, but we now know that it's a lesion with neural differentiation. One other teaching point about granular cell tumor is that the granular cell morphology can develop sometimes in other lesions. For example, occasionally do a shave biopsy of a fibrous papule on somebody's nose, looks like classic fibrous papule, and it's got granular cells within the fibrous papule. Uh, we don't know why that happens, but there's probably about maybe eight to 10 different entities that can get granular cell differentiation in them. And uh, it's not a granular cell tumor, it's just granular cell uh, metaplasia, if you will, that develops sometimes in, in these lesions. We've seen it in atypical fibrosanthoma, it can be seen sometimes in lyomyomas that are true muscle lesions. It can sometimes get some granular cell morphology. So it's an interesting phenomenon that can happen sometimes in other lesions. Here, it's it's really the primary granular cell tumor um, itself. Okay, uh, shave biopsy here, a fairly you know thin lesion, and so it's going to be a little bit challenging when we see something like this to to make a diagnosis. I think that this may have been submitted as rule out a cancer of some kind or another. And you can see it's got this epidermal hyperplasia. If you just look at it at low magnification, it almost looks kind of like a seborrheic keratosis. But if you start looking at it a little bit more, uh, you can see that the epidermis is acanthotic. It's hypergranulotic. It's also got this thick cornified layer. So there's been some rubbing here. And then there's this suppuration that's going on down just beneath the epidermis right here. And so over here, for example, we've got a zone of neutrophils with this uh, rim of stratified squamous epithelium. And what this is actually doing here, we're off to the side of it, but it's actually a little channel that is actually in contiguity with the upper portion of the epidermis. So this is the, the top of that little channel. This, If we had another section, we might actually see a complete, uh, nice 
tunnel, if you will, going all the way to the epidermis. But if you look here, you can also see there are these pink refractile structures surrounded by all these neutrophils in here. There are some histiocytes as well. Uh, and this is a nice example of elastosis perforans serpiginosa. Now, this is in the family of the uh, so-called perforating disorders. And one thing that's in common with all of the perforating disorders is that you have to get some kind of epidermal alteration on top of it for the perforation to occur. It doesn't occur spontaneously. So if you take somebody, for example, that's got chronic renal failure and they're very itchy, they're scratching their skin and they get these areas that look like pragonodularis and then you do a biopsy and you see this degenerated collagen and elastin that's being kind of transepidermally eliminated through the epidermis, that's really primarily secondary to a lot of the peritic changes and the scratching that they're they're doing. If you take those patients and for some reason, maybe they go into a, a coma or something and they end up in the intensive care unit or maybe they're in an automobile accident or something like that and they don't wake up, those lesions go away eventually because they aren't able to scratch them anymore. So you have to have some damage to the epidermis to get the perforating disorders. They don't just happen spontaneously uh, de novo. Uh, there are a lot of these diseases are related to metabolic conditions. Uh, a lot of patients, for example, with this disease will have Down syndrome and you know, maybe their collagen is biochemically altered to some degree. Patients with renal failure, we know that the collagen there uh, is altered by some of the circulating urenic toxins that get into the collagen and maybe cause it to be altered. And so if you and I scratch our skin and rub it, we're probably not gonna get perforating uh, diseases if there's some alteration of the collagen, it becomes an abnormally, uh, it becomes almost like a foreign body, and then it gets transitive or eliminated. So it's probably a combination of some abnormal biochemical change and alteration of the elastin and collagen plus trauma that equals the changes that we see here. So I don't think, again, this, this they probably show you a better example than this on the board. They're not gonna show you a shave biopsy of something like this. They would show you a punch. Um, they're probably not going to ask you to distinguish between elastosis perforans or pigeonosa and reactive perforating collagenosis or Curley's disease because they're all sort of in the same family of entities. But they might expect you to just understand this condition in general and understand which diseases where it may be seen. So that's that's something that you, you very well could uh, encounter. Um, you know, the concept of transepidermal elimination, too, it's not confined to these diseases. Uh, patients that get infectious conditions like chromoblastomycosis, things of that nature, um, they will transepidermally eliminate microorganisms. So if you see somebody that's got a separative type granulomatous appearance clinically, a verrucous lesion, you see little black dots on the surface, you can take those little black dots off and do a KOH preparation. You'll often see the actual medlar bodies there. Uh, foreign material, splinters, for example, somebody may get a splinter, five years earlier and they never dig it out, well, eventually the host will kind of form a channel like this and gradually transitively eliminate it. Uh, yeah, so, so again, it is a way of the host dealing with abnormal things. It's, it's sort of more of a primitive way, if you will, it's just, but it does kind of almost, it really almost flushes the toilet, if you will, and gets it out of your body uh, superficially. But if it's only if your own collagen or elastin, obviously that's, that's gonna be more of a problem since you can't get rid of all the abnormal collagen. Okay, so we got another punch biopsy here, inflammatory condition, and at low magnification, it's a really dense, diffuse pattern when you see that. So this is a nice example of diffuse dermatitis. And you can see it's got this one, as opposed to the mastocytoma we saw earlier or the reptoxanthoma we saw earlier, you can see right away there are a lot of lymphocytes here, black dots at low magnification. So you say, well, there's, there's plenty of lymphocytes in here. But you can, there's also this pallor over here. And once again, when we see pale, uh, we start thinking of, you know, is it possibly some sort of a deposit, some kind of lipid like the xanthoma? Could it be mucin, something like that? Could they just be pale cells? Could they be cells like a lot of histiocytes in there? Um, if it's a neoplasm, you want to ask yourself, it could be a clear cell neoplastic process. So those are just some things we think about. Uh, but dense diffuse, and, uh, you know, again, it's when you think about dense diffuse infiltrates, you know, it's kind of brings up a different pattern 
uh, of, of clinical scenarios that you think about. Think about patients that have like sarcoid, for example, you're gonna see like a diffuse infiltrate of histiocytes in that. Sweets, diffuse infiltrate of, of neutrophil. So uh, again, lots of inflammation diffusely involved in the dermis. It's not gonna be a drug eruption. It's not gonna be urticaria. It's not gonna be anything like that. So your differential is, is different. Uh, and then as you go to further higher magnification, you can see that there are a lot of histiocytes admixed with these lymphocytes in here. So it's kind of got a, uh, it's, it's a little bit, and there's some neutrophils here too. So there's a little bit of a separative granulomatous process, but then you see it's got this other material that's kind of looks grayish blue in the skin. It's got these histiocytes surrounding it. Um, and it's inside many of the histiocytes as well. So this is foreign material. This is not something that's endogenous. Uh, the lipid we saw before, that's an endogenous material. This is exogenous. So somehow material was injected here. And, you know, you're, you're probably wouldn't be expected to just instantly recognize this on the board examination. But one thing that should come to mind when you see this kind of bluish gray material that almost looks fractured and looks like jello is perhaps hyaluronic acid. So it's possible this could have been a filler that was injected into the patient. But there's also some other material here. This is almost like a crystalline material up here. And uh, this, I can just tell you when we saw this under the microscope, we polarized this. This did not come from an individual's face where they might've gotten a filler. I think it came from like a, you know, it looks like the trunk or extremity. And what this was was some type of plastic-like foreign material that looked like hyaluronic acid uh, and it was some sort of traumatically induced foreign body reaction that the patient had. Uh, but they will ask you on the exam to be able to identify the various fillers. And um, I gave a lecture at our conference in Colorado recently about this. Uh, Travis has given a nice lecture about filler reactions also. Uh, and so there, there are certain things that you can look at that kind of have mnemonic devices for you that can kind of remember them. So, you know, things like the polyolactic acid, those look like little, you know, BBs, if you will, they're clear BBs. And radius looks like sort of bluish gray BBs because they're calcium hydroxyapatite. Uh, Hyaluronic acid almost looks like bluish gray jello in the skin. So I would encourage you to learn those fillers because they very well are going to ask you something like that on the board examination. But the key to this is recognizing this dense diffuse process, the granulomatous nature of the infiltrate, and then recognizing this foreign material. And uh, they probably would just say, if they, you were gonna encounter this on the exam, they, they might put this as a multiple choice and might put an infectious process in the differential and they'd expect you to recognize that this was an exogenous material that somehow had been implanted into the patient for some reason or another. So granulomatous inflammation due to foreign body. Okay. Now this is kind of an interesting situation also. Um, we encounter this all the time in our laboratory where, you know, there are certain things that dermatologists do every single day that it's kind of their bread and butter. It's, you know, acne warts, rule out basal cell, rule out melanoma, nevi. And it's sort of, it takes a special case for things to kind of delve deeper. So if somebody comes in with a weird eruption, obviously then you're going to shift gears, but your average everyday bread and butter, just like an internist average, you know, everyday bread and butter is hypertension and diabetes and hypothyroidism and that sort of thing. You know, you're going to be dealing with rule out cancer a lot of times. And so you see somebody come in with a lesion, you're going to say, looks like it might be a basal cell. And so what's the technique that you're going to do to type the diagnose that? We're going to do a shave biopsy. You're not going to do an excisional biopsy of every potential cancer that you encounter. Maybe if you live in Germany or something like that, they don't do as many shave biopsies there. But in the United States, shave biopsy is a dermatologist's number one test that they do. And so as a consequence, we get lots of things that are sent in as roulette basal cell or squamous cell or things like that that are not that. The vast majority of them are, but obviously there are cases where they are not. So, you know, you're seeing a sea of potential skin cancers and, you know, 80, 90% of them are going to be skin cancer, but sometimes you're going to encounter something that's a surprise. 
And here's an example of that. So we've got a shave biopsy. Again, you can imagine they were worried about a neoplasm. And it's got something going on in the dermis here. And it looks, again, it's it's not as jet black and dark as we would expect to see in a basal cell. Uh, is it a squamous cell carcinoma? Well, it doesn't really have much thickness of the epidermis. And there's a little bit of crust here, but there's really not too much of, maybe there's a little solar keratosis at the top. Maybe it's a squamous cell carcinoma. But certainly there's not a lot of epidermal change that would make us instantly think that. And so we go to higher magnification, and indeed it, it is uh, a neoplastic process. And you can see that it's got glandular differentiation. Glands are in here. And if you look carefully, it doesn't really actually involve the epidermis. So there's a, a Grin zone, if you will, and, and Grins is the German word for frontier. And what that really refers to, um, and if you actually go to Europe and go to Germany, they actually have Grin zone on some of the uh, roadside signs. You know, they're saying you're getting ready to kind of enter the frontier between Germany and another country, for example. And so you can think, well, here's maybe, you know, France and here's Germany over here. And then there's the zone, the no man's land, if you will, between those two. And that's basically a normal area of papillary dermal collagen that really isn't affected by that. And it's seen in, in a number of different conditions, uh, certain inflammatory diseases, for example, like classically Hansen's disease can give you that, granular faciality. There's a list of diseases that give you that. But also when you see a cancer that's spread to the skin secondarily, um, you see grin zones like that. So if you have a metastatic carcinoma, for example, that does not usually involve the epidermis itself. It actually involves the dermis and doesn't actually, it's not contiguous with the epidermis. So this probably looked like a little bump on someone. They might've thought it was a basal cell carcinoma and uh, it's a glandular neoplasm. And, you know, so your, your differential right there is, is it a primary benign and nexal neoplasm or is it possibly uh, a carcinoma, either a metastatic adenocarcinoma or possibly a, a primary carcinoma of one of the adnexal structures. And uh, you can see this does not look typical. You got a mitotic figure here. Many of these cells are really strikingly atypical. Um, you might even see some blood, some cells within vascular spaces like there, for example. Um, and so this is a, an adenocarcinoma. It's a metastatic adenocarcinoma. And uh, here basically is a zone of necrosis on moss within the lesion. And you're not going to be expected to really look at something like this and say, ah, this is metastatic pancreatic cancer or, you know, gastric cancer or breast cancer or something like that. Probably the most common cancers we see in, in dermatopathology and at least is, is metastatic breast cancer because they're the most common that go to the skin. Uh, and that pattern is usually different than what we see here. It's usually got the cords and strands of cells between the oncology bundles. Here we've got some nice glands here, which is a little bit atypical for breast cancer, although you can sometimes see breast cancer that can look like this. Um, and so this is happen happens to be metastatic pancreatic cancer. Uh, and this patient had known pancreatic cancer, and they did a biopsy here. And again, I don't remember the clinical impression on this, but it's got crusting on the surface, and they probably thought it was a basal cell carcinoma and just did a shave biopsy, and they were surprised at metastatic carcinoma. So again, uh, if you see this pattern of glands without involving the epidermis, you should think about a metastatic adenocarcinoma. And they, they could very well ask you that general diagnosis. Um, you, some cancers that metastasize the skin do have characteristic features. Uh, metastatic GI cancers, for example, will often have a glands with lots of mucin in them. So you, especially if you see a colon cancer, they have the so-called dirty necrosis centrally. Um, it's possible they might ask you generally, is this cancer more likely from GI origin or not? But that's getting a little sophisticated for a Durham board. Uh, they probably just might ask you metastatic adeno CA and expect you to just recognize that. Probably not an adnexal carcinoma when you've got this pattern and lack of epidermal involvement. So, And I don't think they're going to be asking you to distinguish between a metastatic adeno and a primary uh, adnexal carcinoma. That's, that's not for Durham boards. Okay. So here, we've got a large biopsy. I think it's oriented this way. Here's the epidermis, but it actually might have been sort of a, a dome-shaped papule or maybe a sessile 
lesion. So, you know, it could have been like this. And you ask, well, what part of the body is it from? Uh, and it's got lots of large sebaceous lobules like this. So right away, it's hair bearing, obviously. And this really looks most likely the face. So when you see this many large sebaceous lobules, it's it's almost always going to be on the face. Uh, and, and usually not the head and neck area generally, more likely the face itself. Um, if you see a punch biopsy and it looks like you've got some relatively large sebaceous lobules up here and it goes down to the fat and there's, the lobules are usually situated just at the surface of it, uh, you can think about male pattern alopecia in that situation. But here you've got a dome-shaped papular nodule with all of these large sebaceous lobules here. And you've also got these large uh, cyst-like structures that they actually may be a little small cysts themselves, but they're probably just dilated follicular ostea here, dilated follicles associated with these prominent sebaceous lobules. And then in addition to that, there's all of these dilated blood vessels. There's this stroma where there's an increase in the number of fibroblasts and this mucinous-like uh, texture, if you will, to the to the derma. So this is a, a sign of a chronic edematous swollen dermis when you see this pattern. Okay, and it's on the face. So if you see these kinds of massive sebaceous hyperplasia, these areas with these cysts uh, with the sebaceous glands surrounding them, which these are just little hair follicles that are just turned into little cysts. Here's another one up here. This is a classic example of uh, rhinophyma, uh, which is basically in the family of rosacea. And you can imagine you've seen what these people look like clinically, J.P. Morgan, you know, the big nose that's bulbous and everything. And so when you treat those patients uh, with electrocautery or surgery or whatever, and you cut off the specimen and send it in, this is what it looks like. And the pathophysiology of that process, it's both uh, hormonally driven sebaceous gland hyperplasia, well, it occurs in women too, but it's far more common in men, uh, as in addition to the, the swelling, the lymphedema of the area. So there's, this is a combination of congestion. Uh, there's, there's lack of blood flow out of the nose back in, and, and they may have some background sinusitis or some inflammation that kind of drives this. A lot of these patients do have long, they have allergies and things like that that kind of contribute to it as well. And this stroma is really very characteristic. And there's a family of diseases in addition to rhinophyta that can give you this same thing. Uh, histologically, there's another condition known as Morbihan syndrome, solid facial edema, which is a similar process. It's in the same family of this massive rosacea. And, and, and they will not always get the big, large, uh, bulbous areas in their nose. They'll often get a solid swelling, sometimes of their forehead, maybe the glabellar area. And you biopsy that, and it looks similar to this. They may have less sebaceous hyperplasia, but they get a lot of this change. And if you get someone with that, uh, you should work them up to make sure they don't have any kind of neoplasm or anything kind of uh, proximal in the sinus or or maybe in their you know uh, skull area, something along those lines. Um, but it, they're often associated with this really poor circulation and lack of drainage of lymphatics from the area. Uh, and in the case of rhinophyma, in addition to all the sebaceous gland hyperplasia and the cysts and whatnot. Um, so this is in the family of rosacea. It's just, there's like, you know, five or six different variants of rosacea. And you get the rhinophyma, the metaphyma, the pustular rosacea, the telangiectatic rosacea. Um, so, so there's several different variants of rosacea. There's even uh, lymphocytic infiltrate photosensitive rosacea, where you really looks almost like lupus histologically and gets clinically overdiagnosed as lupus many times when it's really not lupus, but gives you some lymphocytic infiltrate. So nice example of, of rhinophyma here. And, uh, you know, they, they could theoretically show you something like that on the board and expect you to be able to, to know that. Okay, another punch biopsy here. Uh, again, taken probably from trunk or proximal extremity. And as we look here, we can see that it's an inflammatory process once again, mostly superficial perivascular infiltrate. And again, hopefully you'll be able to recognize that these are mostly going to be lymphocytes here. They're dark and they're black. And then if you look carefully, you can see that there's a, a cleft and it's probably real space between the epidermis and this infiltrate beneath it. 
And there's maybe some infiltrate down here too, but mostly it's going on in this area. And you can see that the epidermis itself is involved by the inflammation. So that this is an interface dermatitis. And in order for it to be a real true interface dermatitis, there's really two types of that, as you know, there's both the vacuolar and then there's the lichenoid interface dermatitis. It really needs to obscure the dermoepidermal junction and involve the dermoepidermal junction. If it's just a band-like infiltrative lymphocytes, that's not really and truly lichenoid or interface. It really needs to affect the epidermis for it to really and truly be uh, an interface dermatitis. And here you can see the lymphocytes, the vacuolar alteration of the dermoepidermal junction, the individually necrotic keratinocytes, and then also notice that there's a basket weave cornified layer. So that tells you that this is something that happened acutely. It didn't even have a chance to form a parakeratotic cornified layer. So interface dermatitis, lymphocytes, uh, necrotic keratinocytes, a true blister. And how do we know that it's a real blister, not just an artifactual cleft? Because there's something in the space. There's some serum in here, and there are also some inflammatory lymphocytes in here as well. So if we saw this without any history, uh, the first thing that I would think about would be erythema multiforme. Uh, that's a classic pattern that we see with EM. I uh, say, well, can a drug eruption give you this pattern? The answer is yes. But drug eruptions are usually more slowly, uh, they develop more slowly. They don't happen quite as acutely. They can, but not usually as quickly as erythema multiforme. So if I were going to choose between a drug eruption that was interfaced with this keratotic keratinocytes and EM, I would favor EM because of the basket weave cornified layer. Most drug eruptions usually would have some alteration in the cornified layer with some parakeratosis um, and that sort of thing. So probably erythema multiforme. Now, this case is interesting because it also has got a little bit of a lymphocytic infiltrate that extends a little bit deeper. And erythema multiforme usually doesn't have that. So... This is something that you wouldn't know and wouldn't really be expected to know, but something that you can think about. So if you see something that looks like EM, but it's also got a deeper lymphocytic infiltrate, think about the possibility of Rowell syndrome, which is a combination of erythema multiforme plus lupus erythematosus. Um, that's the way that I was taught to think about that disease. Um, I think there may be some new information about it, that it may not be quite that simple. But in general, that's a nice way to think about it as a patient with lupus that's got erythema multiforme. And it's not really lupus. It, it does really and truly clinically, when you see these patients, they really look more like EM rather than bullous lupus. Uh, and so some people say, well, maybe it's a variant of lupus that looks like EM in the epidermis, but uh, it really clinically will look like EM with targetoid lesions and that sort of thing, but it can have a deeper infiltrate. So maybe that they've got some background lupus in the biopsy. You probably wouldn't be expected to look at this slide and come up with that diagnosis, but they might ask you about Rowell's. Like, what is it? Uh, what's it thought to be? And, and that sort of thing. Lupus can occur in association with, with not only erythema multiforme, the other classic situation is pemphigus erythematosus or center usher syndrome, which is kind of, again, an, a combination of lupus plus superficial pemphigus. So there you'll often see a biopsy with the acanthalysis superficially with features of lupus, sometimes at the dermal junction and with the deep lymphocytic infiltrate as well. So understand some of the variants of lupus, uh, chilblains lupus, this is related to lupus, pemphigus erythematosus is related to lupus. So just understand that, you know, lupus is an interesting condition that can have a lot of overlap and maybe even have other diseases that can be associated with it. And, you know, they might possibly ask you that somewhere on the, on the board examination too. Okay, this is a shave or curatage biopsy. It's a very small biopsy. And one of the, the reasons that it's small is not that the person just was sort of had a phobia of taking real biopsies, if you will, but the location sometimes can compromise your ability to take a deep, large biopsy. There's some places on the body that dermatologists just hate to biopsy. 
Um, they don't like to biopsy the mucous membrane. They sort of don't like to do a punch biopsy the scalp. It's messy. You got to do it with the hair. It bleeds, and and it's 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 a hassle. Um, they don't like to biopsy kids. The kids scream, and it's hard to get them anesthetized, et cetera, et cetera. The nose, unfortunately, lots of cancers occur on the nose, but um, there's not that you know we get very superficial biopsies of the nose. They're often inadequate. Sometimes we biopsy something. The diagnosis is possible surface of fibrous papule. Patient comes back a year later, and then it's an obvious basal cell, and they sample it. And they say, well, you didn't call it a basal cell a year ago. I say, well, you didn't sample it a year ago. And so you, you have to bite the bullet when you're trying to diagnose a skin cancer in an older person in a funny location that might give them a bad scar, you know, that, that they don't like. But say la vie. I mean, this is basically you're trying to diagnose cancer. So this is the eyelid. Okay, and that's another place that dermatologists really don't like to take a biopsy. And I'm not even sure this was actually taken by a dermatologist. We have some ophthalmologists that sent us some eyelid biopsy. So that's possibly why it's such a small lesion. But you see, even though it's very small, it's a neoplasm. And it's got these basaloid cells here, small aggregations. We can't talk anything about breadth, symmetry, circumscription, any of those sort of things. So all those bets are off. So you have to look at the individual aggregations of the cells themselves and decide what you're dealing with. And, and this is why knowing the location of lesions is very important. We, we hammer on that because there are a lot of diseases that affect certain parts of the body, but they don't affect other parts of the body. If you call something dishydrotic dermatitis from somebody's back, they're going to think you're an idiot. So don't, you know, don't do that. You know, we get biopsies of roulette severed dermatitis from somebody's, you know, foot. Well, who would think that, you know, you never get severed dermatitis in that location. So here's an eyelid lesion, and it's got a basaloid neoplastic condition, and it's got a lot of mucin in it, okay? And so when you see basaloid, you know, your first reflex is basal cell carcinoma, obviously. Well, here, this does not have classic features of basal carcinoma. There's no peripheral palisading of the nuclei at the, at the periphery. The cells are, are small. They're dark. They're you know, basically cuboidal. Um, the mucin is present both inside these aggregations and here at, at the periphery. And you want to look at the whole thing. So go look at another area. Here is some shatter artifact, but the cells look pretty much the same. There's not as much mucin in that little piece. Here's a larger piece. And again, these cells look small and basophilic, but there's really no, and this isn't really a cleft. This is just an artifactual tear here. Um, so it doesn't have the features of a basal carcinoma. And so when you see a basaloid lesion, you have to think about what other cells can give you basophilic cells and there's a neoplastic process. So you should think about an adnexal neoplasm. Maybe it's an eccrine or apocrine lesion. Uh, you should think about neuroendocrine carcinoma. You should think about the possibility of lymphoid lesion. That can sometimes give you small round. Well, it does give you small round cells. They're not usually quite as epithelioid as this, but they don't have as much cytoplasm. But certainly lymphoid lesions, and they can sometimes have mucin associated with them as well, mycosis mongoides with follicular eugenosis, for example. And so knowing that this is from the eyelid, and this is something that, that you should just kind of know. Uh, if somebody calls you in the middle of the night and says, hey, I got this basaloid lesion on the eyelid of this older person and it's got a lot of mucin in there, what should I be thinking about? You should instantly think about possibly this entity, mucinous, uh, mucin-producing neuroendocrine eccrine carcinoma. You know, basically, it's eccrine carcinoma is what they, they call it. And basically, swaypoint carcinoma. And what this is, is a, it's a neoplasm. It's malignant. It's thought to be maybe in the family of the neuroendocrine carcinomas because it stains positively with neuroendocrine markers, but it behaves more like a sweat gland mucinous carcinoma of sweat glands. And the, the classic morphology of the just mucinous carcinoma of sweat glands is you get the sea of mucin with these aggregations of these mucinous, these, these uh, basaloid cells floating freely in that. This lesion, this so-called endocrine mucin-producing sweat gland carcinoma, tends to be more solid with mucin that's produced by the tumor. So they look a little bit different. Um, they're probably in the same family of lesions. Um, if you see one that looks more like this, you can call it, you can favor this entity. And if you wanted to stain it to be positive with some of the uh, neuroendocrine markers, synaptophysin, INSM1, for example, 
Um, if you stain the Swicklin carcinomas, they they generally don't tend to stain as heavily as, as strongly with those markers. Although I'm not sure that some of those lesions that for years have been called that may not actually stain positively with these. We just didn't work them up for that back then. Our most important differential diagnosis is that we didn't want to miss the diagnosis of a metastatic mucinous carcinoma from an internal site. And that can be difficult to do just looking at it histologically. But if it occurs in the eyelid area and they don't have any known history of any underlying cancer, 99% of the time it's primary and it's not associated with a metastatic process. And the good news about those is both this lesion and that other type of mucinous carcinoma tend to be low grade in biologic behavior. They need to be excised. They can recur. And if you leave them there long enough, they can sometimes become more aggressive. So you don't want to just leave them there and not do anything with it. Uh, but basically, even though it's got the neuroendocrine staining pattern, it does not indicate that it is really uh, going to behave like a Merkel cell carcinoma, for example. So that's the good news about it. But you do need to get these things out and, and not just leave them alone. And, and you want to make sure, especially the mucinous carcinoma, you're not missing an underlying mucinous carcinoma from another side, like the breast or GI tract, for example. So it's a nice example of this entity. We have better examples, but you know, given that it's on the eyelid, that's kind of generally what we get as far as the biopsy goes for that. All right, this punch biopsy, uh, as opposed to neoplasm like the last case, we have an inflammatory process. Notice that it's got a nodular and diffuse pattern. Okay, so we talked about Swedes, we talked about sarcoid. Another uh, thing that you worry about when you get a nodular and diffuse pattern is possibly an infectious disease. So you know, obviously at low magnification, so we want to make sure we're not going to deal with an infectious process when we look at it at, at higher magnification. A lot of these cells are lymphocytes once again. Um, you can see there, there may be some other kind of cells in here because they're not all just jet black. Uh, some of them may be histiocytes, but notice that some of them look a little bit um, almost like salt and pepper, I guess is a way to think about it. These are lymphocytes. These are not lymphocytes. And so if you see, they say, well, you know, these probably aren't all histocytes, but they're not lymphocytes. Maybe they're neutrophils. And so when you get a diffuse nodular for lymphocytes and polys and maybe some histocytes in here, again, you really want to think about the possibility of an infectious disease. And here at high magnification, you can see that indeed they are all neutrophils, tons of neutrophils in here. Um, these are some lymphocytes, but it's a nice contrast between the lymphocytes and the neutrophils over here. So when you see a lymphocytic nodular lymphocyte plus neutrophils like this in the dermis, it's probably not one of the classic neutrophilic dermatoses. Those are things that you would put in the differential diagnosis. Um, you know, maybe your weird sweets, less likely pyotomic diagnosis. But I'd be more worried about the possibility of an infection. And when you see suppuration, primarily, the most common cause of infectious disease with separative, mostly inflammatory response are the pyogenic uh, infectious diseases, staph, strep, um, those things will give you this. Uh, there are other conditions, uh, gonococcal infections, things of that nature. They can give you suppuration sometimes. Uh, things like uh, nocardia, actinomyces, those can sometimes give you separation, but those usually will get more in the separative granulomatous pattern. And then the atypical mycobacterial infections, they tend to give you more of a separative, mostly pattern versus the uh, deep fungal infections, which almost always give you a separative granulomatous reaction with overlying epidermal hyperplasia and, and pseudocarcinomatous hyperplasia, which we really don't have so much of that here. So if you see something like this, you're obviously going to stain this, and you're going to look for infectious organisms, PAS, fight, maybe a brown brin stain. Um, some of these cells look a little, these are histiocytes here. Some of them look like they might even have a little bit of foamy cytoplasm here. And again, if you see histiocytes with some foamy cytoplasm, you think about the possibility of Hansen's disease or anything about the possibility of uh, maybe an atypical mycobacterial infection. And this was actually, when we stained this with the fight stain, it was strongly positive. So this was a mycobacterial infection. And we didn't know for sure uh, when we did this, it's going to be a weird case of Hansen's. This isn't a really good uh, pattern for Hansen's unless somehow this is a patient that's partially treated and they got a secondary reaction 
that caused all this suppuration. This is an ENL where you get vasculitis. Um, so probably more likely just an atypical microbacterial infection. Uh, someone maybe got a went to a nail salon and and got a pedicure and got infected that way. Maybe they got uh, maybe they worked in the uh, somewhere they were exposed to salt water or then the, like a swimming pool granuloma, for example, or Bacterium marinum, M. abscessus. Those can all look similar to this. But as a general rule, less granulomatous inflammation, less separative granulomatous inflammation, the AFB infections than the deep fungal infections. But they, they tend to give you more of that pattern. And I think that may be because the fungus kind of gets recognized almost like a foreign body, like that case we had before. Uh, whereas this is more like a little more akin to a pyogenic infection in some ways, if you will. So this was an example of an infection, separative dermatitis with a little bit of granulomatous inflammation due to acid vast bacterial infection. Okay, another deep punch or maybe an incisional biopsy here. And once again, we're dealing with a neoplastic process, low magnification. You can see these cells have this dark purplish uh, color to them. Um, we've got a punch, so it's kind of difficult to assess the architecture. But if we just look at this area right here, it seems to be relatively uh, well circumscribed, seems to be relatively symmetrical when we look at this. There are multiple aggregations here. They go down to the bottom of the specimen. And notice that it's not really contiguous with the epidermis, okay? Hard to tell what part of the body we're on at this power. Uh, certainly doesn't look like the face or ac acral skin, anything like that. So maybe somewhere on the trunk, uh, but we're not 100% sure. And if we're going to say, do we think it's likely to be epithelial or non-epithelial? It certainly looks epithelial at low magnification. It's blue, uh, makes you think of maybe some kind of basaloid differentiation, possibly, maybe some kind of a nexal differentiation. And you can also see there's some of these little cleft-like structures in here. We're not sure what those are yet, but we're going to see when we go to higher magnification. So here we go to higher magnification, and now those cleft-like structures are important. They're actually the uh, the ducts, if you will. These are the the this is a ductal differentiation, and so these are the lining of these ducts here. And so when we're looking at uh, a lesion that's got glandular differentiation, obviously you want to look to see what kind of lining of the ductal structures that you have here. And if we look over here, we have a very nice example of apocrine decapitation secretion. So this is a lesion that's got apocrine differentiation. Now, if you didn't know any better, there's, there's really only about three or four or five apocrine neoplasms that you need to know. Uh, probably the most common that we encounter in dermatology is syringosis I know papilliferum on the scalp if somebody's got a nevus sebaceous. Well, this obviously isn't that. It's not contiguous with the epidermis at all. Uh, if you see that same type of differentiation, but you kind of implant it deeper into the dermis and stick it in somebody's uh, genital area, well, then we call it a hydradenoma papilliferum. Uh, so this looks a little bit like that. Uh, however, this does not have those central cores of plasma cells that we see there. Um, so, but you would, but if you saw something like this, certainly that would not be uh, a bad thought. And, and, you know, again, the board examination isn't going to try to help you distinguish, they're not going to ask you to distinguish between something like that and something like what this turns out to be in this case. This biopsy happens to come from the nipple uh, of an individual, and it was a pink, red, eroded lesion. And it's, it looks very much like a hydradenoma papilliferum, doesn't have all the plasma cells in it. And this is what we call a nipple adenoma or erosive adenomatosis of the nipple. Um, it's a benign neoplasm. It's not breast cancer. Um, we often get biopsies of this to rule out breast cancer because uh, it's on somebody's nipple area. It's red, it's eroded, so everybody starts panicking and they think it's you know pageants or something like that. And we get a biopsy and the good news is it turns out to be this. But probably the most important thing is recognizing that it's glandular, recognizing that it's apocrine. Uh, and if you know that it's from the nipple area, you can know the diagnosis is a nipple adenoma or adenomatosis. If you don't know that, you want to think about some of those other adnexal neoplasms that are apocrine in differentiation. There are a couple others, tubular apocrine adenoma, uh, apocrine cyst adenoma, solid cystic apocrine cyst adenoma. Uh, apocrine hydrocystoma, those are all some other 
epicrine lesions that you need to know. Uh, but basically, this is a nice example of a nipple adenoma, which is just another benign nexal neoplasm with apocrine differentiation. And the breast uh, glandular tissue is really just a gargantuan apocrine gland <laughs> that instead of making apocrine secretion, it makes milk. So really, when you, and that's why the lesions histologically look like apocrine when you look at them under the microscope. Why don't we do one more? And another example of a neoplasm here, and it's a shave biopsy. And again, you can see that it's kind of shelled out, okay? Pretty big lesion, but we don't have the whole thing, but it looks relatively symmetrical when we look at a low magnification. And when the lesion kind of shells out like this, that's another sign that it's more likely um, to be benign when you see that. And these lesions commonly get submitted to us as roulette cysts, you know, adnexal tumors. Uh, dermatologists never really think about them. They, they think that anything in the skin that's kind of feels subcutaneous is going to be a cyst, and they, they submit it to us for that. And so it's got these areas that are, are dark and, and bluish, so there's probably going to be some basaloid-like cells in here. Other areas are pink, and you've got this area here that looks very, very dark and purple, and then this area that's that sort of looks pink and sort of hyaline in its morphology. And as we go to higher magnification, you see that there are these aggregations of these epithelial cells here with ductal differentiation. You've got calcification. You've got ossification. So there's actually bone that's formed. This is osteoid over here. These are almost look like little shadow cells, but it's actually forming bone. And then if you look down in a couple other areas, you may even see some areas where there's some cartilaginous differentiation. And so this is an example of a mixed tumor of the skin, um, basically a chondroid syringoma. Here's some nice chondroid up here. And whenever you get chondroid in the lesion, uh, it can actually eventually turn into bone. And in this case, it actually happened to do that. So this is an example of a mixed tumor of the skin. And it's a pretty good example because it's got bone, it's got cartilage, it's got areas of uh, eccrine differentiation, small round cuboidal cells, some that have clear staining cytoplasm that have all the glycogen in their cytoplasm, and so others have basically no cytoplasm at all. You've got ductal differentiation, uh, you've got the thick collagen between the individual aggregations, and then you've got the, car the chondroid, the bone, and the calcification. So this is chondroid syringoma or a mixed tumor of the skin. Um, you almost certainly will encounter this on the board examination. They're gonna show you some adnexal tumors. They're just expect you to kind of know the general most common ones. Uh, they're probably, they're not gonna show you anything weird like a area of a malignancy developing in one of these. They'll just show you something like this and expect you to know the diagnosis. So anyway, so hopefully you enjoyed this session this morning. Um, it's recorded for those who weren't able to join live. You can go back and look at this at any time at your own. And um, again, this is a good way to test yourself. To uh, I would recommend looking at lots and lots of these images and slides and that you kind of look at these and be able to come up with a different diagnosis pretty quickly and, and make a, a diagnosis pretty quickly before you actually take the board examination. So... Uh, Good luck to you, and we will see you uh, next month. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Cockerell. This was really helpful. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye.